I'm John Freeland and I'm a condensed matter physicist. Early memories of science was sort of a funny one. I was trying to think through like when I got really engaged in science and I think I was always interested in the way things worked. But uh, if you ask my father, he would say I tended to take things apart and not put them back together. <laughs> But, uh, but I think that was a lot of it was just curiosity. So I was always very curious, but I don't think I really connected with science as a discipline, um, probably until I was in high school or college. I grew up actually about two hours north of here in Waukegan, Illinois. Um, I followed a very circuitous path. I went to um, college in Beloit, Wisconsin, it was a small college called Beloit College. And, um, and after that, I went to graduate school in, uh, at Johns Hopkins University, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. And I went and had a postdoc uh, working at Brookhaven National Lab. And then uh, just by chance, a job opened up here, and I ended up here, back close to home. I've been at Argonne 17 years. <laughs> it's pretty scary. It, it flies by. I think it makes you feel pretty good to think that people recognize what you do. You know, it's it's not always easy to tell. You know, sometimes you you think it's it's not observed, and so um, so it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of fun to be put out there. Ladies and gentlemen, here's John Freeland. Tonight, I want to talk to you all about a story of cooking. In this case, I'm cooking up new materials. And so uh, what we like to do is we like to make new materials by making sandwiches where we layer atoms, just like you would in a sandwich, in different layers to make new materials. And then what we do is we try to use x-rays to look inside these materials and figure out how they behave. Now, before I tell you more about these things, so each of these balls is an atom, I want to give you an idea of the sense of scale. So the distance here is a fraction of a unit we call a nanometer. So a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. You could take a meter stick and you could chop it up into a billion people, pieces. Now that doesn't work for me. So um, I decided to make you all atoms. So you can imagine if each of you is an atom, there's about 20 of you in a row. Um, if I put four or five of these rows together, which is the length of a couple of swimming pools, I would have the distance of about 10 nanometers. Now, if I took those and I kept these rows going all the way from here to St. Louis, what would happen is I would have something about the width of a human hair. And what I'm gonna talk about today is looking at materials which are called crystals, and that is you're almost like a crystal. There are a few missing people. But uh, the point is that pe the atoms are in periodic arrangements. And I'm gonna talk about controlling things at the level of sort of one row of people here. So that sets the scale. Now, why are we doing this? Well, I do it because I find it very interesting, but I think it's simple, you can put it this way. We have a very simple mission at Argonne, this is the way I put it. Um, we want to enable all of this in our lives without doing this. It's very simple. And, uh, and so to un let you understand how we do that, let me give you an example. So this little widget here was built to test questions about how two materials come together at the atomic level. And people had a lot of thoughts about how this worked, and these guys actually built this thing. And um, this thing is called a transistor. It was developed in 1947. About 10 years later, this was developed into a device that we started using in things. You may remember the solid state radio. And today, putting a whole millions and billions of these together, we have a supercomputer. So it was really those fundamental questions about how two different materials meet that led to this new technology over decades. Um, you heard also about batteries in Jason's talk. Batteries also enabled a lot because batteries allowed us to take these computers and make them mobile. Now, if you start to imagine the future beyond here, where do we go next? Well, everything's surely going to get smaller, and it's going to get more functional, do more things for us. Uh, we may even put it in our body and, um, or on our clothes. But there's a catch to all this. All these gadgets are costing us. The more and more gadgets we have, the more and more energy we need to power these gadgets. And so this is a big problem. Going forward, we have to figure out how to meet this need. Now, one way to meet this need is to find materials that work much better. 
And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about uh, using x-rays to understand materials. So we're here at the advanced photon source. You're sitting here in this building right now. This is about one kilometer in diameter. And this is a place where we make very, very intense x-rays. And x-rays are great because they give us lots of information. So we use some techniques, and uh, I'm gonna show you two of them very schematically. One technique is called diffraction. So the idea is we take an x-ray, we shine it in, and these x-rays bounce in these crystals and come out in certain directions. And by figuring out what those directions are, we can actually figure out where the atoms are. So this is a, a technique that allows us to see where the atoms are. But this doesn't tell us if I stick two different materials together, it doesn't tell me how they behave. So I use another technique called spectroscopy, where I use different colors of x-rays, and those colors are tuned to different atoms in my material. And by tuning those different colors, I can measure how different atoms behave in this thing. And so I wanna to talk to you today, give you two examples of work that I'm doing now, and show you how x-rays are helping us to understand these things. So I've broken them into two problems. The first is a growth problem. So we grow these materials. And so the question is, how do these materials grow? There are lots of open questions about how these materials are made. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about putting two different materials together. These materials actually have the same types of atoms inside. In this case, it's strontium, titanium, and oxygen. Um, this is what we call the unit cell. So if you imagine these are like Legos and I stick them together, I can make a giant crystal of this thing. Um, but there are other variations of this. This is another variation um, where I have a different amount of strontium and oxygen, where I have this structure with the different layers. Now, if you don't look at atoms all the time, and I have a 15-year-old son who loves Legos, so I visualize this as a Lego problem. Okay, it's very simple. I have two layers of atoms in, this, in both cases. In this case, I have a blue one and a gray one, and I just alternate them, blue, gray, blue, gray. In this other one, I have two blue and then a gray, and then two blue and a gray. And so what I wanna do is I wanna put these two materials together and I wanna understand what's happening as I do that. So yeah, use a technique, it's called molecular beam epitaxy. That's because we create, we heat up chunks of atoms and create these beams of atoms that we can shine onto a sample that's typically very, very hot. And then we bring in x-rays at the same time and what this allows us to do is watch what happens as those atoms hit and stick to our sample. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so we can watch where the atoms are, and by controlling these little shutters, we can open and close and create whatever sequence of atoms we want. So it was very simple. We had a very simple problem to do. I wanted to do the following. I wanted to start with this material, <coughs> this blue-gray, blue-gray, and I wanted to do a very simple thing. I wanted to grow a blue layer, and then I'm gonna grow another blue layer, and then I'm gonna grow a gray layer. It was very simple. But what we found happened was, well, I have this sequence, I grow a blue layer, okay, everything's fine. I grow a blue layer, everything's good, we're really happy, we know what's going on. But then when we grew the gray layer, something interesting happened. Even though we put it up here, it actually rearranged, those layers of atoms rearranged into a new arrangement. And the reason they did that is because nature was saying, you know, I prefer to have blue-gray, blue-gray. I don't like this whole blue-blue-gray thing. And so, uh, so nature was forcing it to go in a different way. And this, we did this about a year or two ago, and this was the first time anyone had seen this directly. And then we were able to use that understanding together with people who dig deeply in how to model these things. And from that, not only were we able to understand this problem, but they were then able to use it in to make new materials. And we were able to use it because we started picturing that, oh, these atoms won't always stay where we put them. Sometimes they're gonna move around. So if we can predict that, sometimes we can put them in a different place and get them to go where we want them to. So the second problem I'm gonna tell you about is what I call a behavioral problem. I was thinking of this actually as, you know, I have two children, you know, um, as you're growing up, you sort of go through growth problems. You know, you outgrow your clothing. Um, if you're a younger sibling, you have to deal with passed down clothing, which can also cause problems. Um, maybe you have behavioral problems, either your adults are not behaving like you want them to or something like that. And so the idea was to put, in this case, we wanted to mix materials that didn't like each other. So we wanted to take two different materials that don't exist together in nature, have very different properties, 
But these properties tend, at least in our knowledge, they tend not to like each other. But the great thing was we could stick them together so we could take this material, um, which is a ferromagnet, so this is like your refrigerator magnet, which, which sticks to your refrigerator, and we can stick it together th with this material, which is a high temperature superconductor, which you may have heard about. This is a material that below a certain temperature it carries current with no resistance. And so in general, these two types of property don't like each other. So what we did was we put these things together and, um, and we were able to actually do that. And we were able to use x-rays to show that that was what we did. But then what we found was, I have here these blue atoms and these gray ones, and I know how they behave when they're on their own, but what we found was actually when you stuck them together, their behavior changed where they met, okay? And using this change in behavior, we can start to now predict what might happen as we put other combinations together. Now you would say, why does this matter? I'll take you back to this problem. This was exactly the same problem with much simpler materials. You were trying to stick two different materials together and um, ask what happened at the boundary between those two. And the consequence was a huge change in our life. So um, I'm not saying I'm gonna make a huge change in your life, but that's what the point of doing all this is. So um, with that, let me finish. And, uh, and as, uh, as many other have said, you don't do this alone. This requires lots of people with different areas of expertise, and so I just put the names up here to show you that it took a lot of people to make all of this happen. Thank you very much.